So surely that's the message you want to be putting out into society. It kind of blows my mind that people would want to put the opposite out where they're giving them an excuse to act in such a unhuman way almost. Mm -hmm. it's, it's incredible. It, it really is incredible. And, and since there is not a single decent argument for determinism, that sounds like a bold claim, but when you read the stuff and you take a look at their arguments, there's not a single credible, compelling argument for determinism. Welcome to the Prime Life Project podcast, a place to help you unlock your full potential, both mentally and physically, to become the best version of you. Before I get into today's episode, I just want to make a quick announcement that when you think the episode's over, it's not over, uh, because when I basically uh, ended the conversation with my guest today, uh, I got Mikey, like I usually do, to ask uh, if he had any questions for the guest, and Mikey did, and I've actually decided to keep Mikey's questions in, because my guest gave some really good um, answers to Mikey's really good questions, so when you think the episode's over, it's not over. Keep listening. You've got a little bit of bonus uh, footage to come at the end. So keep on listening. Welcome back to an episode of the Prime Life Project podcast, a place to help you both mentally and physically become the best version of yourself. Today, I have a guest. So if you're a new listener to the podcast, I do three different types of episodes. I do one where it's just me by myself, uh, where I use uh, my years of experience coaching. I've got uh, over 11 years worth of uh, experience coaching to basically try and help impart some of the wisdom uh, that I've learned and I, that I use personally on my clients to basically help them through uh, and just guide them on their journeys. Um, again, when it comes to mental health, uh, physical, whatever it is like i like to impart my 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 wisdom things that i've learned even stuff like personally that i'm going through in my life and i've learned from uh, i always like to just impart that wisdom uh and then just just put the information out there for you uh, i've also got another episode where it's me and mikey so that's more of a, a laid-back casual conversation just two guys uh normally talking about things that are mental health based uh and again a lot of it's very very relatable to, to, to people and we get quite a lot of good feedback from that and uh like i said i uh, love those episodes with mikey and then i've got a full-length episode which basically we've got today where i have a guest on uh, and we then deep dive into a topic so today's guest uh, is a guy called David Lawrence, and we're talking about a very deep, interesting, potentially controversial topic of free will versus determinism. So David is obviously very, very passionate about this topic. So when you're listening to this episode, go into it again, like you guys always do, with an open mind, because if you've never thought about this topic, which, by the way, I hadn't until I came across David, I'd never really thought my views on free will. Uh, you hear my views on free will in this episode because I've got my beliefs on it. I didn't know that I had my beliefs. Um, so basically, David talks about what this determinism view is um, and then basically what free will is. And basically, we have a really in-depth conversation. And um, basically, David tries to debunk this um, determinist view. And I'm very glad that he did because uh, before I got David on the podcast, uh, he basically said to me, like, um, why do you think I'd be a good fit for this show? Um, because he wasn't quite sure. Obviously, he reached out to me and we had a conversation. And then he was a bit like, I'm not really sure if it's a good fit. But I basically turned around to him and said, like, the whole point in this podcast is to help people mentally and physically become the best versions of themselves. And when I did my research into this free will, and I found out that some people genuinely believe this deterministic view, I was then like, well, people are going to be like, what's the point? What is the point? Why try? And it's a very defeatist view on life. So I had to bring David on to basically debunk this because I didn't want people to go again. And I never tell people how to believe like your beliefs are your beliefs. And I, I fully respect anybody's beliefs. But if you haven't ever questioned your beliefs, potentially you're pigeoning, pigeonholing yourself into a place of unnecessary negativity and defeatism which I don't want for anybody. Uh, I want all of you guys to win. That's why I do this podcast. Like I'm, I'm so bad before, like it costs me money to do this podcast. I make no money from doing this. I do this because I want to help people. I want to pass on the information I've got and I want us all to level up together. Like that's my, what I genuinely believe is my purpose here. So having a guest on like David for me is really, really powerful because it's a completely different topic. It's something that you guys may have never heard of before and it will either help you question your beliefs in a healthy way or it will confirm to you kind of what you already know and help you push on your path. So uh, my guest today is Mr. David Lawrence. Hey, how you doing? I'm very well, thank you very much. How about yourself? Uh, I'm doing pretty well. Yeah, nice amazing. sunny day in California here. 
as I say, it's really nice and warm here in the UK as well. I've just come back off holiday. So people are watching this on uh, Spotify or uh, YouTube, you can see I've got a bit of a tan going on, which is nice. Um, so this, this episode, like I said, we meant to do this uh, before, but I had technical difficulties. So this is an episode that's been, uh, what's the word? Um, on the edge of my tongue, shall we say, for uh, a good few weeks. And I'm eager to talk about it because it's a, a conversation, like we've said off air, um, because as I said, you had a conversation with me and said, uh, about how would this fit into my, my, my podcast. And again, just for the audience, the, the topic we're going to talk about today of, of free will, it's really important that I got David on here to have this conversation because for me, fundamentally, if you don't think that you have free will and that you think your life is predetermined, then for me, what's the point? And you probably feel the exact same way. So for me, it's really important I've got David on here to have this conversation to basically just get you to think outside of a potential box you've been put in. So uh, again, I didn't even know this was a thing. Uh, I hadn't even thought about free will. I hadn't even thought about if we had free will uh, until I heard about David and then did a bit of research into it. And I've sort of gone down my own rabbit hole with this. So I'm actually delighted to have David on here today. So David, before we get down this sort of rabbit hole, um, can you just talk to to my audience about what got you interested in this topic initially? Sure, sure. Um, I read a book. I read a book called Free Will by Sam Harris. And I picked it up and when I was done, it was like, what? This can't be possibly the case. What are you talking about? And I had liked Sam's stuff or Mr. Harris's stuff from other books and things. I thought he was a smart, articulate guy. But when I read this thing and with a good moral compass, I should say, and when I uh, read this thing, I thought, what the heck is he talking about? None of it struck me as right. None of it struck me as making sense. The arguments were all crazy all over the place. And generally my intuition, right, just said, this has got to be wrong. I don't know a lot about the subject, but this is nonsense. So that's what happened. And I started researching and looking it up. And I, I was intending to do a 10 or 12 page article uh, that became a 30 or 40 page article, which became a hundred pages and so on. And then it became a, a full length book. I, did, I didn't start that way. And in the course of research, I realized in looking on YouTube and podcasts and so forth, that there's a lot of new media personalities who believe the same thing. We don't have free will. We're robots, we're caused by outside forces. Our thoughts, our actions are totally determined. And um, Harris isn't alone on that one. And I, as I read more and more, and I realized the arguments were pretty much bunk in favor of determinism. Um, and I was just astounded by uh, what I found out and the arguments that the uh, people who call themselves determinists don't even deal with. Hmm. So it's kind of one of those things where, you know, you find what you think you're going to find, you know. Mm -hmm. And, and so scientific evidence is used in the wrong way and the conclusions are just reversed and everything. So that was sort of my discovery process, uh, all, all from reading one book and having the intuition that, wait a second, this is not right. This can't be right. Mm. So what, what are the main arguments that like Sam Harris then puts forth? I know there's quite a few of them. What are like, the main things for him that basically uh, he used in the book to basically say that, well, yeah. our life is determined? Like, what are they? Well, yeah, let me, let me um, if I could take a couple minutes and just spell out what determinists believe so Absolutely. that the audience and you and I are clear on it, um, because it's very counterintuitive, as I say. They believe that at the Big Bang, way back when, 14 billion years ago, forces were unleashed, and they, those forces followed causal law, cause effect, cause effect, all throughout time, till now. So we're part of a causal chain that goes all the way back to the Big Bang. Every thought we have was determined at the time of the Big Bang. Every action we take was determined at the time of the Big Bang. That's why my book calls us biochemical robots. Actually, taking a, a phrase from Harris's book, we are biochemical robots. All we're doing is following causal energy that was put into play 14 billion years ago. We can't think, we can't choose these are all illusions we can't define ourselves we have no power over anything we're just sort of like passive little vehicles watching things happen that we have no control over so that's the basic determinist position you don't control your thoughts you think you do but you don't you don't control anything you do you think you do but you don't hmm. and everything in your universe is a causal effect goes back to the Big Bang. So that's the basic determinist point of view. And, and really, it comes out of science. You know, scientists are looking at the world and seeing 
things follow after each other and sequences and that's sort of their model of things. Um, so that's the determinist point of view. Hmm. They have various arguments, but I have to say arguments has to be in quote. The first one that uh, Harris gives is that uh, free will has to be absolute. It has to be all or nothing. He says that we have to have complete control. This is his words, literally complete control over all the factors that determine us. And the answer to that is why? Hmm. There's no argument for why that has to be how you define free will or why that has to be the case. It's just pronounced as a given. But it isn't a given. Common sense knows that we, we can operate free will within all kinds of restrictions and parameters and boundaries. We have bodies with four limbs. <clears throat> we have a certain history. <clears throat> we have certain physical attributes. We live on a planet that has this atmosphere. There's nothing wrong with saying that free will has to function within parameters. Mm. And in fact, I argue in the book that you have to have parameters. You couldn't have a world where there was nothing for free will to push against and manipulate and, and uh, handle, uh, you have to have those. But the determinist argument, the first one is, yeah, it's an absolute thing. You have control of everything or nothing. And having control of everything is really being God, right? I mean, mm. you have to be God. Mm. You have to control the Big Bang. There's nothing that influences us that you can't control or you don't have free will. So that's, that's the quote argument. It's really more a pronouncement. So they saying that like everything. So for example, like the weather, we can't control the weather. We can't control what animals do, but are they saying that, that that's all also predetermined? So everything, like literally absolutely everything is predetermined. So if a dog decides to, like a random lion comes into this office right now and rips off my arm, that was predetermined. Mm -hmm. is, that, is, that, is that their view? So it's not just us, it's everything in the world. A everything in the world. They, they do admit to a little randomness can come in. Maybe there's some random events that happen, but of course we can't control anything that's random. Mm -hmm. So, so, so a lot of determinists say, well, it's determined, but you know, there may be various randomness bits where just things happen. There's no prior cause, but other than that, yes, it's exactly as you say. But then, that, but then surely, surely, like you said before, then, then that whole point of the randomness, surely that then defeats the whole argument of determinism then, because that bit of randomness surely will then throw off the entire matrix because that randomness will have to be equated. So then let's say you're driving down this, let's say, for example, it's a scale electrics car, for example, down a track, and then just randomly the track changes, like mm -hmm. it can't be going down the same track, the car will have to change track, and that can't be predetermined, surely. So then surely the whole argument falls apart. The whole argument, yeah, that's exactly right. And I actually have a, a good section on you can't rely on determinism and then have no basis for determinism. It doesn't get you to free will, however, mm -hmm. because what they argue, and this is they're correct about this, is we can't control random events, right? They're just random. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They just happen. So it doesn't get you to have free will. It can't be the basis for free will. But they still rely on the causal world. You know, the chain of causation that goes back to the Big Bang is behind virtually all their arguments, even though there's a footnote for random events mm -hmm. that we can't control. But, but, but you're absolutely right. It's, it's um, uh, the, the fact of randomness disrupts the whole causal chain idea, mm -hmm. right? Yep. I mean, it could all be random. It could be some combination. But they cling to the, the uh, causal uh, forces going back to the Big Bang for most of their arguments against free will. Actually, but, just for all of them. So we, 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 we spoke about what determinism is. Do you have a definition of what free will actually is? Or like what... what... <laughs> I know this is a big topic. I laugh itself. because it's a, it's, a, uh, it's a difficult topic because there's different definitions depending on who you talk to. The bottom line, common sense, conventional wisdom, what we all mean when we say it is, is, is called libertarian free will, okay? W which is really the only kind in a sense. If you pull aside all of definitions and silliness, uh, we have the ability to make choices and those choices affect the world mm -hmm. and our mental intentions and consciousness have an impact on physical reality and the impact on physical reality is is defeats the idea that something had to happen because of causation we can go this way or that way sometimes it's called choosing otherwise or doing otherwise and the otherwise is it didn't have to be the way it was we could have chosen the other way now, determinists go crazy when they hear things like that and talk about it being impossible. But, uh, but as I say in the book, none of their arguments really wash at the end of the day. Um, so free will, we have the right to choose, we affect reality, it comes from us, 
We're not constrained uh, to do it. We're not caused to do it. We have to operate within constraints. And that's something that the determinists don't seem to understand when they make this absolutist kind of argument, control everything. But within those constraints of who we are and our past and our parents and where we were born and the time we were born and all the things that are just normal boundaries and limits, uh, the definition of the libertarian free will is we can choose and our choices affect reality and we could have chosen otherwise. So that's the sense in which I, I call it maybe the most robust sense of the word of free will because mm -hmm. they're sort of watered down silly versions that we don't have to go into. It's interesting, like obviously we mentioned Sam Harris is quite a big name, but also I think it's to mention that uh, the, the person on the other side of the argument is also Jordan Peters, because again, it's like so people might have heard his name, just so, so people like to back up, like it's not just you got Sam Harris and then other people like going against them. Like, there is some big names on either side, if that makes sense. Like and Jordan Peters and Sam Harris have had a bit of like back and forth about it all, haven't they as well? Like it has been quite an interesting conversation to listen to. Yeah, I think, I think though almost all, the major high majority are with Harris and are determinists. In fact, I don't know of anyone of the big media pundits. Well, it's, it's, it's possible uh, there are a couple others, but, but Jordan Peterson has come out in a tape and says, I believe in free will and here's why. He's got a couple of cockamamie reasons why that are sort of like just shy of the mark because he hasn't read all the science and so forth. But, but, but he's the only big one that I know of. Um, uh, so, so Harris really has the majority of the pundits. And that's what I learned when I, my first research of the book. And I was really surprised. Well, I think, so. I, think for, I think for me then, if you've got like quite high end people, see, I'm trying to link that this back into when uh, we had the podcast with Betty, uh, because essentially what Betty was saying with this is that when it comes to like the, the Bible, essentially that um, we've been lied to and that the Bible has actually been inverted, basically putting all the power outside of us, basically saying that we can't control anything. It's God that controls it all, which is essentially what this determinism is. So I'm thinking about what we're talking about now. If all these big name people are saying that your life is what it is, then as mm -hmm. you said, it disempowers the masses. It's almost like, well, if you haven't got it, you're never going to get it. So why bother? So for me, it's just like a, almost like this determinism mm -hmm. is almost like a power control mechanism, really. If you, if you kind of put it that way, like if, if you're poor now, you're kind of always going to be poor unless through some miracle has been determined ahead of time through no mm -hmm. fault of your own that you're not going to be poor. Does that make sense? Yeah, you, you are making the correct conclusion based on if the world is determined, why bother? Mm. You know, we can't control anything anyway. The determinists have a way of dancing around that. They just ignore determinism and say, well, we have to go about and we have to put people in jail and we have to protect society. And they violate, in saying things like that, they violate every single principle of determinism. Because of course, if we can't control our actions or our thoughts, we can't put people in jail. People go to jail if the big cosmic forces back in the Big Bang uh, predestined them to go to jail. So what determinists do is they just abandon all principles of uh, determinism in order to say, well, of course, we have to make decisions uh, about this and that and the other thing. And it's sort of like, what do you mean, of course, we have to make decisions? What does that mean? Where did you suddenly derail yourself and are talking about decisions? And I have a whole chapter in the book um, called Having It Both Ways, because throughout free will, Harris talks about as if we had free will. You know, well, we have to we have the right to protect ourselves from dangerous people, he says at one point. Well, how do we do that if we don't control our thoughts or actions? How do we determine who's dangerous if our thoughts are just caused in our brain to happen? And anyway, who is dangerous? Somebody who's behaved a certain way dangerously? Maybe they won't in the future. We can't tell. It's up to the, the powers that cause our thoughts. So they jump into talking about a free world universe that violates every principle. There was, there was a guy named Robert Sapolsky. Have you heard of him? He's a evolutionary biologist and he's a teacher at, uh, you know, one of the big schools, Stanford. What's, what's, what's his last name? Sapolsky. S-A-P-O-L-S-K-Y. Yes. Uh, why zebras don't get ulcers. Uh, that may be one of his books. I haven't yeah. heard of that one. Yeah, I think. There's one called Zebra or something. Yeah, was, yeah, yeah that's him. Yeah, that's yeah, him. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. him. So he's a scientist. And as a scientist, uh, he's a determinist. And there's a, a, a interview where he goes through the whole scientific thing on how we're determined, our thoughts are caused, they're not ours, 
We can't take any action that wasn't predestined a billion years ago and so forth. And then somebody asks him a question about, well, how do we go about in society? And he says, oh, well, we have to take dangerous people off the streets. I'm not saying we shouldn't do that. Now, that whole statement is 100% violating determinism in every possible way. Well, why should we do that? There's no such thing as morality. That's just a thought that's planted in our brain. How can we do that if we can't take action because our actions are not under our control? He just abandons the whole concept of determinism to say, well, oh, sure, we should take people off the street. Well, how can who's going to take people off the street if we're determined? Who's going to decide to take people off the street? No such thing as decisions. Who's going to control their actions to take people off the street? Well, not us. Our actions aren't within our control. So what determinists do, they play this fancy dancing game where if you say to them, well, certainly if everything is determined, you're not going to let somebody, you know, assault your kid or break into your house, this and that. What do they do? Snap. They do the dance and suddenly they, they're free will advocates without calling themselves that. Oh, yeah, you have to protect yourself. Well, hold on a second. You just said you can't protect yourself because you can't control your thoughts or actions. And whatever happens was already predetermined. Mm -hmm. You can't affect anything. Now you're saying we should go out and hunt criminals and take them off the streets. They talk out of both sides of their mouth. Mm -hmm. And they have to because otherwise they'd be saying such ridiculous things as determinism has such ridiculous consequences. Mm -hmm. You know, why do anything? So, so, um, and this, by the way, Sapolsky is a terrific guy. I mean, he seems a really decent guy, super knowledgeable. His lectures on biology are just fascinating. But the scientific outlook is just rigorously implanted in his mind. But why, why, why do you think they're so all or nothing? Because we had this conversation when we spoke last time off air. And my view is, which I think backs up your view, my view on this is sort of, for my audience to sort of um, clarify sort of my view on this and where I think this sort of whole thing is, because I think, uh, to use Mikey's word, one of Mikey's favorite words is nuance. There's a nuance to everything. So I fully believe that there's a universal energy. There's a universal energy, uh, again, and that basically essentially does pull us through life. So I liken it to a river. So you are going down the river and there's nothing you can do about it. You have two choices. You can either consciously get your boat and steer through choice which direction you're going to go down the river but if you don't choose to take conscious action or conscious thought you will literally just drift down the river of life being pulled by this universal energy so for me like it's very obvious that there's, there's two sides it's like well some stuff is determined if you take no conscious control of your life you're going to drift along and your life will be determined to you by other people's actions but if you actually consciously decide to steer the boat you can't go upstream you can't go upstream. It's always exactly. going forward, but you have a choice of where you're steering your boat and ultimately where you end up. And again, at some points when you're steering, you will get tired and you'll stop. And then guess what? Your boat will get drifted off course again. So for me, it's very obvious, where, especially when you go down a spirituality route, that there is an energy, there's a universal energy field, but you can pull from it and you can actually determine, uh, uh, what else would, um, choose. So for me, it baffles me that you've got these super smart scientific guys Mm -hmm. that are so polarized to just know it's this. It baffles me, especially when you talk about, uh, you blow my mind there about Rob Sapolsky, because again, his books are good. He's really smart. So for Terrific. me, I, I thought he'd be able to critically think a bit more to be like, oh, mm -hmm. I think maybe actually it's a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. But you can't sell a book on a little bit of both, can you really? It's, you've got to, do you mean, you've got to make it all mm -hmm. or nothing, really. It is pretty incredible. And I, I was surprised when I first started researching about how many people believe this uh, uncritically. But again, you have the scientific outlook. They're trained to, to, to cause effect, uh, no longer with quantum physics, but we could go into that whole thing. But they're trained to, to look for causes and effects and explains things. And um, uh, it's sort of an indoctrination. But, but, but I love your metaphor of the river because it, it reminds us that it's so important that we take control of ourselves and, and uh, paddle the way we can and battle the river currents the best we can and go with the river currents that you know, empower us. And this determinist philosophy takes all of that away and says, you can't do any of that stuff. You can't think, you can't choose, you can't act. You're powerless to the forces outside you that you can't control. So it takes it all away. It take, takes all the meaning of, of, of defining yourself and, 
you know, creating your life away. So you're exactly right in everything you said. And I can't, um, other than the scientific outlook and indoctrination, it's hard to understand why these minds, um, sorry, I got, um, but it's even worse than that. It's even worse than that because what determinists are not seeing is that if everything is determined, if all of our thoughts are beyond our control, then theirs are too. So when they say the world is determined, where do they get the privilege to say that? That thought is just as determined as everything else. What they're thinking is everything is it determined as your and my thoughts about freedom. So if it's determined, they had to say it, right? They were forced to say it by these cosmic forces in a cosmic causal chain. So when they proclaim the truth, whether it's Harris or Sapolsky or whatever, they're making a truth claim, right? The world is determined. There's this chain of causes. It goes back to the Big Bang. What we think and what we do is the product of those causes. We don't control them. When they say that, they're making a truth claim. But they forget when they're making that truth claim that it applies to them. How do they know the world is determined? They were just caused to think that. If the world is determined, they were just caused to think that. It's another thought that they had to think. They had no choice not to think it, right? Because it was created by these causal forces. So nobody can say what's true, including determinists, because truth and our thoughts about truth are caused in our head by cosmic forces. So the irony of all these determinists no matter how brilliant they are, and they're brilliant. I mean, these, you know, Sapolsky and all these guys, Harris too. It's, it's not a matter of brains, it's a matter of an outlook because if they think about it, they don't have the right to make truth claims. Whether it's determinism is true, there's no free will. Wait a second, you just told us everything was caused in your head. Mm. So that's caused in your head. You don't believe in determinism because it's true. You believe it because a bunch of cosmic forces in a causal chain going back to the Big Bang made you believe it. Mm. See, they don't apply it to themselves. And it's a, con a contradiction at the heart of all determinist principles. Mm -hmm. So it's even worse than what you say, all these brilliant minds and so forth, you know, have these ideas, but they're also a living contradiction. Mm. So you say with the, say those so the sentences you said before, where we spoke before, we said that um, if someone says uh, nothing's true, well, if nothing's true, then that sentence can't be true. It's like that, that whole thing. Could you explain that as well? Because that's an interesting way to look at it as well. Well, there's, yeah, sure. There's this class of uh, claims called performative contradictions. And it's a fancy name and all of that. But what it really comes down to is that it, you can make statements that contradict your ability to make them. They're, they're a circle. Like that, that famous Ouroboros, the snake that's biting itself mm -hmm. and, and going around in circles. Uh, and the claim, nobody knows anything, is a perfect, simple example. Because if you say that, you're saying that you don't know anything either. So then the claim is false, right? Because you don't know that it's true because nobody knows anything. So you can't make claims like nobody knows anything because it grabs the speaker up mm -hmm. in the grip of the claim. And if the speaker doesn't know anything, they can't claim that nobody knows anything. It takes truth out of the equation. And determinism does the same thing. All of our thoughts are determined. Well, hold on, time out. That means that thought's determined, right? Mr. Determinist, you didn't have a choice to say it. You didn't have a choice to believe in determinism. That belief in your head was also caused by these causal chains. Uh, so you can't say it. You can't say it's true. You can't say anything is true if all our thoughts are compelled by cosmic forces. That, that by definition, the source of our thoughts is a causal force, then so are the thoughts that say that. And so it turns around and bites itself. Mm -hmm. I won't say where, by the way, I'm being <laughs> polite, being polite show. But, <laughs> but, but that's basically it. And I, I go through a, a few fun performative contradictions in the book to get the idea that, that, that there are statements that you cannot make that violate the rules of logic. Uh, like nobody knows anything, you know, or, or nothing anyone says is true. Mm. Well, that's somebody saying it's true that nothing that anyone says is true.
So it's that circular kind of a thing. And I, and I realized that all determinist claims um, suffered this uh, problem. And it's never talked about. It's never talked about with one or two exceptions that I give in the book. Nobody talks about this. And, it, and it's the fundamental flaw at the heart of determinism. It makes determinism absolutely indefensible. If all thoughts are compelled, then whatever determinist believes are compelled by mm. cosmic causal forces. They don't believe it because it's true. They believe it because they were compelled to believe it. So they, they bite themselves in their butt, pardon us. Uh, they get caught, they get trapped in their net. We can use any number of analogies. I, I, I just feel it's bizarre that you would, especially if you're that quote unquote intelligent, that you would accept the fact that your life is predetermined. It just baffles me that you have that kind of intellect where, again, especially when it comes to science, you're meant to be looking, science basically meant to, you're trying to use the information, the facts to come out with like this conclusion. It baffles me that people would accept that as a foregone thing. Like, because for me, if I'm like, well, my life is all determined, like literally what is the point? So I don't understand how these people can be talking about it from such a place of your life is predetermined and then be happy with their life. I, I don't, that doesn't sit well with me. It's like, so you're just meant to just strap into this journey until you die. And there's nothing you can do about it. it just, that to me just absolutely baffles me. Mm -hmm. There would be no joy really. If that makes sense. I, I don't know. It just doesn't, mm -hmm. I, I don't understand. Cause for me thought, like when you're thinking, when you're sat there thinking, you, you can see that you're creating things like again, all the creative, the artists again. And I believe that you do pull things from the quantum field and that's where this information comes from. So the fact of mm -hmm. Sam Harris with this determinism, he's got it from somewhere. But mm -hmm. he, he must have had that, made that decision to play with that thought. Does that make sense? I, I don't know. It just, I don't understand how you can just accept that as your life. Does that make sense? Yeah, it, it, it is hard. Uh, one way to look at it is that in our intelligence is separated. To, we can make a distinction between our intelligence ability and the beliefs and emotions that fuel those beliefs that we're indoctrinated into. And um, they're two different things. We all know people who are super smart, who believe the craziest things. I mean, you shake your head and go, are you kidding? Mm -hmm. This guy's super smart, he's educated. How could he believe that? We all know people like that, right? So there's a divide in some sense between our intelligence and education and aptitude in the intellectual realm and all the stuff that we inherit from our parents and our schools and uh, governments and all the ideas that are thrown at us, uh, you know, in growing up, um, there's just a divide there. And, and being super intelligent doesn't mean you have, don't have a bunch of irrational beliefs because everybody does, mm -hmm. you know? The other thing I was thinking that occurred to me when you said that, because I like your point of view about how, what you're, what, to me, what you're really saying is that decisions and self-expression is the center of our lives. So how can these intelligent guys go, it's all a fiction, it's not real, you know? Mm. And, and, um, and who's telling us that, by the way? Mm. Who's, who's choosing to tell us that, you know? Um, but I think maybe the other thing is that we all get bogged down in limitations. You know, we have fears, we have anxieties. Um, we feel that we have inherent limits that then limit us, whether we do or we don't, we sort of trip ourselves up and you know, we all know stuff like that. So I think it could be a intellectual uh, projection, if you will, of our, our own fears and limitations about our power. You know, because we all feel we all feel limited and we're all overwhelmed by power in certain situations and, and, and we have our anxieties and our stuff. So maybe and I'm just speculating, this is some intellectual version of reflecting our powerlessness and we all do feel powerful, powerless at any given time. Right. Mm. And it's that battle in the river, as you say, to to take control of the currents and paddle the most productive way and take back our power as best we can within the challenges and the confines of the currents of the river. Mm. So in a weird way, you could think of it, I, I, I do as I'm thinking it out, as a, um, a projection of our, our limitations in, in sort of the metaphysical realm of do we have free will and all. Mm. So uh, one of my favorite quotes is, um, 
Uh, our deepest fear is not that we are power. Uh, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond recognition. It is our light and not our darkness that most scares us? Is that Nelson Mandela quote? So essentially, it's like that, isn't it? What you're saying is essentially it's the fact that it, it, people's limitations. They're afraid of potentially trying. They're afraid of trying. They're afraid of failing. About the what if it doesn't work? So it's just easier for them to accept. Well, if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. It's predetermined anyway. So it kind of just takes off any accountability onto them. So if when they get to 80 years old, their life's a train wreck, they can just be like, oh, well, you know, it's, yeah, there's nothing I could do about it. It is what it is kind of thing. And like I said, I, I, I use that phrase, it is what it is, but that's when there's things outside of my control because there is things out of your control. Absolutely. But, but you can always choose how you respond to that. You do have a choice no matter what people think. Like there's things that might not, Mikey could stand up and do something absolutely nuts. I can't control Mikey, but I can control how I respond to what Mikey does. You could say something ridiculous right now, like something's completely outlandish. I can't control you. But all I can do is mm. respond in my own way. It's, so for me, I think it's quite a fascinating concept that's throughout there of like, actually it's people's own limitations and it's their almost mm. way of justifying playing safe because yes. people don't like stepping out of comfort zone. And I feel like, especially nowadays, there's a lot of stuff where the gap between the haves and the have nots has become so great that it's an even bigger jump now. So people are fearing that jump even more almost. Mm hmm yeah. By the way, I can't control Mikey either. I've tried <laughs> for years. He, he, he's just—he's just not controllable. We just have to. Uh... We, we, we know that. <laughs> We've done special episodes on Mikey. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but you're right. It's a ready-made excuse for all kinds of things. And uh, I joke in the book that the devil made me do it, or the cupcakes made me do it, has become you know causal forces have made me do it because it is an excuse, and they've done tests. And I write about this in the book, um, and, and Harris writes about it too. He has it in his book that, that they've done these tests where they read things and make people all geared up that they have free will. And they read things and go into stuff and they're geared up that they're determined. And then they see what happens. And they put them on computers where they say something's wrong and you could cheat if this page comes up, but don't look at that page and all that kind of thing. And what's the result? Just what you thought, people who believe in determinism, right, uh, are more likely to cheat, be aggressive, take on antisocial conduct, be less helpful, because of what you just said. It is a, uh, a way of saying, oh, well, you know, I don't have to take responsibility. Uh, uh, it would have happened anyway. I mean, I, I couldn't cause my cheating. It was, it was cosmically ordained, right, since the Big Bang. So they've done these tests, and, and lo and behold, it's just what you think. Determinism encourages people to cheat and behave badly, and free will encourages people to uh, step up and be responsible. So, so it is a ready-made excuse. Because I think it's also, I also think it's actually irresponsible. Now you've said that. I just think it's irresponsible for people to be pushing determinism. Because as you said, I could go and do absolutely anything. I could walk onto the street right now and headbutt the first person and be like, oh, well, it's predetermined. But it, it gives you an excuse to act and do crazy things. And just be like, oh, it is. So what kind of message is that actually sending out to people? Like, why would you want mm -hmm. to put that out there? Because as you said, surely if mm -hmm. like you, you mm -hmm. want people to like, no, 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 no. You mm -hmm. need to become this, this like kind loving mm -hmm. person, but you have to work on it. Like, so to become this mm -hmm. best version of yourself. So surely that's the message you want to be putting out into society. It kind of blows my mind that people want to put the opposite out where mm -hmm. they're giving them an excuse to act in such a unhuman mm -hmm. way, almost. Mm -hmm. It's, it's incredible. It, it really is incredible. And, and since there is not a single decent argument for determinism, that sounds like a bold claim, but when you read the stuff and you take a look at their arguments, there's not a single credible, compelling argument for determinism. You could say, well, okay, maybe we don't, can't prove free will. We know determinism is a bunch of bunk and my book takes you through why that is. Um, so what are we gonna believe? Are we gonna encourage people? So let, let, let's say the question's out, the jury's out, okay? All right, we don't know. Let's say we don't know. Could be random. Maybe it's not determined because that, that's just ridiculous, but, but whatever. Say, say we don't know for sure if there's free will. So what do we do? We want to tell our teenagers that we're all determined. Don't worry, you're not responsible for your behavior. Or do you want to encourage people to, that they have control of their lives, that they can accomplish something, that their lives mean something, that, that they have the ability to steer that ship or paddle downstream, as you were saying. Um, 
of course you want to encourage people to to have power and to be empowered and to use their power for the good so that's again i guess i'm expressing in another way you're amazing it's like how can the all these people go out there and encourage such absolute disempowerment and and that's really probably the best reason for the book and to to stop this nonsense what i just something i want to look back onto i wrote down in my notes you mentioned quantum physics we kind of just skip past that what part does quantum physics play in this what role does that because you sort of mentioned it uh and kind mm -hmm. of stop yourself going down that rabbit hole but i'd like to sort of stay back and discuss that bit what what does quantum physics have to do with, with any of this what does that say well it's 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 a mixed bag and complicated because there's a whole bunch of different theories of quantum physics because nobody knows what it means there's that famous quote from the physicist Richard Feynman that uh, if you think you know what quantum physics means, you don't know what quantum mm -hmm. physics means. And he's got a couple of clever quotes because nobody does. Know. And this is one of the premier contemporary scientists who said that nobody knows what it means. So it's a little difficult because you have to start with there's various interpretations and some of them are causal. But the traditional uh, uh, quantum interpretation is that it turned a causal universe, the Newtonian causal universe of classical physics into a probable model of the universe. So it introduced probability and it took away causation, uh, to put it simply. Now, again, there's, there's, there's schools of thought, of quantum thought that say, no, 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 there is causation. We just can't find where it is. They call it hmm. hidden variables. And they say, well, one day we will find it. I, Einstein was in that camp, no small mind. That, well, we can't say why it's causal and there's no evidence, but one day, there's got to be because they just didn't accept the idea that uh, that uh, God plays dice is the famous mm -hmm. expression by Einstein. He couldn't believe that God plays dice. So but but in mainstream thought, it, it, it broke the causal chain and uh, said that the universe is probable. That doesn't mean we have free will because we still have to com control probable outcomes, but it means that that something new can come into the universe that isn't beholden to the past, right? Um, yep. we, uh, sometimes it's called novelty. And it also uh, brought in the concept that what happens in individual events, events are somehow weirdly tied to a broader pattern of things. So what happens in an individual case is what it is, but then if it happens enough, a pattern emerges and that pattern has to also be in those individual things, but we have no idea how. The other thing it, it brought in, and this is a big one, um, in the old Newtonian model of the universe, uh, influence was physical and physical contact, bang, a mo molecule had to bang another molecule or a quark had to bang another field or whatever it is. It was physical contact. Now, free will is this weird, mysterious thing that, that determinists emphasize, because how could you have something mental that isn't physical? At, at least that's under the, there's other ways to, to say, no, free will is grounded in physical stuff. But putting that aside, how could something mental, an intention, right, get into the physical world and start moving around physical stuff? Mm -hmm. Because influence under the original Newtonian model was physical contact. Called, I think it's called contact mechanics was sort of a phrase used for how influence. Well, there's, there, there's various weird stuff in uh, quantum theory, even weirder than basic quantum theory, where there's, there's non-physical influence, where something happens over here and two galaxies away, instantly something happens that corresponds to that thing here. And no, uh, in our universe, nobody knows how, nobody knows what the influence is, Nobody knows if you can even quite call it influence, but these two things are conjoined in some way and it's not physical. There's not anything physical we can find um, or physics can find at this point. So it, it, it took away the idea that influence had to be physical. Now in the traditional free will model, right? We're influencing things, we're influencing the physical, but we're what? Mental intentions and desires and, and choices and so forth. So, so it created the possibility that non-physical things can indeed influence the world of physicality. It isn't just contact mechanics of boom, boom, molecule against molecule. Something else is going on in the universe. We don't understand it. I was referring to something called entanglement, where one uh, measurement over here 
causes, again, it's not really caused because there's nothing physical, but something happens two galaxies away instantly. Mm -hmm. They're joined together. We can call it influence, just for lack of a better word. Something else is going on that isn't physical in the universe. Mm-hmm. The other thing that, that, that quantum theory did is that it, it, it pretty much did away with causation in the following sense. Put aside the causal interpretations, maybe one day we'll find uh, uh, hidden variables. And there are some other causal interpretations besides that, in fairness. Um, put aside that bottom line, quantum equations tell us how reality works. It, they predict reality. Causal equations, the old Newtonian causal science that determinism is based on, do not predict how reality works. They get close. Quantum equations tell us how reality works. So I think I may have a line in there. So the, the determinism has placed their bets on the wrong science. Hmm. Because no matter what side of the free will debate you're on, it's, it's incontrovertible. Quantum equations match how reality works as best anything matches causal equations do not they're inaccurate and they're only used only in quotes they're only used when you don't need precise so the world isn't isn't obeying causal laws it's obeying something else probable non-physical influence we don't understand how it all fits together but it opens up the whole horizon for the possibility of free will causal universe when everything was a mechanism you couldn't have free will right Hmm. so basically the mere fact that that quantum equations is what tells us how reality really behaves and causal equations don't hit the mark what does that say it says we're we're in a universe where it doesn't seem like causation is really calling the shots Hmm. and all of determinism is based on causation i think it's for me, it just blows my mind that we don't know so much about the universe and how much the world works. It's, I know I've said this multiple times in this podcast, it still blows my mind that people would speak so factually on something and say, no, this is what it is. It blows my mind. I don't understand how you can do that because you don't have enough evidence to back it up. We still don't know. We still don't know so many things. And like I said with quantum physics, it's mm. given us a better understanding. So we can look at some of these old models and be like, well, actually, no, we can sort of disprove a lot of them now with these new models. But even with that, we still don't know. For example, mm. why are we here? We still don't know. How do we, you know I mean? there's so many things that we just don't know these things, like this universe energy. What is this universe energy? Mm-hmm. Who knows? So I, it just blows my mind that people can make such big mm-hmm. factual black or white claims when mm-hmm. the evidence to me is very clear that we don't know. So if we mm-hmm. don't know, clearly it's got to be more beneficial to sit somewhere in the middle. And even if it's somewhere on one side or the other, so maybe more determinist than a free will, but there mm-hmm. should be that fluidity to be like case by case, decision by decision. Like, well, is this more determined or is this like free will? Do you know what I mean, it, it, I, I just don't understand mm-hmm. how people come to this conclusion when we don't know so much. It's, it, it's incredible. And one of the examples that Harris gives in the book is free will doesn't work because or or doesn't exist because nobody has ever described how it works, how how, uh, mental reality can affect physical reality in a way that attests to its existence. And, and, And this is exactly it's what you're saying. Well, Harris, you're saying that because physics doesn't presently understand the mechanics of free will, it doesn't exist. Are you kidding me? Was that I mean, meditation? Uh, is, that, is, that, is that meditation? Meditation has been around for thousands of years, and mm-hmm. only now is quantum physics starting to back up the power of meditation. You couldn't mm-hmm. explain it. You mm-hmm. could not explain it. But now you've got these things where you can actually see all the energy around the person change as they're meditating. Like, oh, these mm-hmm. Probably mm-hmm. Don't. But you couldn't have explained that thousands of years ago. So to make mm-hmm. a statement, to be like, well, you can't prove it. Like, mm-hmm. what? It makes no sense. Well, I, exactly. And I made a list of some of the biggest things that science can't prove right now. And it's incredible and that th- they don't understand. OK, and in, in one of the uh, and, and by the way, some of them in the last 20 years, it was discovered that the universe is expanding exponentially. It keeps increasing and increasing on the increases. It wasn't known before 20 years ago. Brand new discovery. So we didn't even know how the universe operated in the biggest sense 
of where's it going, what's it doing, what trend does it have? The last two, two millennia were wrong about all this, right? Within the last 20 years, it was discovered that not only expanding, but expanding exponentially, never known. The other book, the other example in, in the book in response to Harris is, well, nobody can attest to how it works thing is that there's a, a physicist named Brian Greene. I don't know if you know him, but he's, he's, he's terrific. He's popular. You should check out his books. He's got wonderful podcast stuff going. He has a, a New York Science Festival where he gives incredible lectures on, on quantum theory and Einstein and so forth. Anyway, in one of his books, I, was, I, I, I stumbled across something where he said, it, it's, it's recently been discovered that hot water freezes faster than cold water hot water freezes faster than cold water. And he says something to the effect of, for those of you who think physics is at the end of the day, who would have known that we can't explain, I'm paraphrasing, we can't explain it, but we just realized that hot water, and you know, you'd think cold water's halfway there. So cold water has to freeze before hot water. Physics doesn't understand why, why, why hot water freezes faster, evidently, uh, but it does. And this is a fairly recent discovery. The most basic thing, how does water freeze, right? So when you make statements like free will doesn't exist because nobody can test to its mechanics, it's like, whoa, really? So I guess water doesn't freeze. So forget that scotch on the rocks, you know, <laughs> uh, water seems to freeze. So, so I'm just illustrating your point, which is that there's so much we don't know that we don't even know the most pedestrian things. We didn't know how the universe was going and what direction until about 10, 15 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. We discovered the most important uh, element in the element school, the Higgs boson, gives basically mass to other particles, wasn't even discovered before 20 years ago or so, maybe 25 years. Uh, we don't know how water freezes. So, and we have determinists saying, well, you can't explain free will, so it doesn't exist. It's like, hey, dude, there's a lot of other things that we can't explain here. Mm. You want to talk about what we can't explain? So, and, and physicists are the first ones to, to admit it humbly, what, mm. what you're saying, that we know so little about anything. Mm. You know, say, and yeah. ima imagine 100 years from now, right? If someone's having a conversation of how the world works in physics. They're going to look back and think we're fucking idiots, right? Mm. We're, yep. We're, we're totally morons. We're totally ignorant morons. And we look back 100 years and we say those guys were ignorant morons, you know? Mm -hmm. It's the way science works. It evolves. So I'm reinforcing what you said with different words. You know, yeah. it's incredible that somebody has the, the, the hubris, and I don't mean that in a bad sense, but the intellectual hubris to say, well, we don't understand it. Uh, therefore, it doesn't exist. No, no, honestly, I completely agree. Uh, it's mind blowing. Uh, yeah, on, honestly, this whole conversation has been mind blowing for me. And like I said, it, I, I think my audience would agree that like I said it's definitely, uh, it's got me thinking. Like I said, as you're talking, it's got me thinking as well. Um, where can people find out more about you? And where can people find out more about your book? Like, where can people get a copy of your book as well? Well, the book is called Are We Really Biochemical Robots? Which is asking the question of Are we what the determinists say we are? And um, I have a, a, a website called biochemicalrobots.com in which there are clips from the book and, and, and things like that. Um, and um, uh, we have an Instagram page and that kind of stuff on bi uh, biochemical robots pretty much gets you in there. Mm -hmm. and, and as I told you, I'm coming out with a workbook version which mm -hmm. sort of illustrates and has fun questions and answers and ideas that go beyond the you know, uh, scope of the uh, scientific stuff. And uh, I sent you a little thing of it and it's, it's yep. really got some fun graphics and, uh, and that'll be kind of fun. Biochemical yep. Robots, the workbook. Awesome. I'll get, I'll get Mikey to put all the links down at the bottom of the screen as well. So people can go and check out that as well. Oh, so, cool. Thank you. Honestly, no, David, thank you very much for your time today. It's been absolutely awesome. Yeah, it's been fun. Do you have a question? Oh, uh, uh, so, uh, so, and, and you, Mikey, would. Mikey, he's uncontrollable. Like I told you. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, what you got? I got a few, mate. Um, that two, two questions. Then, really, um, what have you heard the the quote about the the monkeys with typewriters and Shakespeare? Yeah, yeah. So, so when they're talking about infinity, then yeah. Uh, so it, it's uh, it's been used as infinite monkeys could create. The, the works of Shakespeare at times. 
when, when you're looking at time and they're talking of infinity, do you see time as linear then? So it, because I suppose would determinists say that everything that has happened or can happen has already happened? Is that a concept that they sort of stick with? That if time's infinite, what is infinity? Everything's already happened. Is that is that a determinist idea or ideology? Yeah, they think everything is a machine. Everything yeah. unfolds mechanically, uh, or maybe with some randomness. But er everything is mechanical. Everything yeah. has been predestined. What, what but it's an interesting time. It, well, that's it's an interesting thing you mentioned because Einstein you know, brought in some far out ideas about space and time, you know, and, 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 and he said that uh, this is also in the book, but it, it, you know, the, it, during the big bang, everything became so crazy dense before it, uh, you know, exploded outward that the laws of physics make no sense. Time makes no sense. There was no time before there was time. When you think about that, it's like, wait a second. Well, then what was there before time started? There had to be something, was there time? your mind could go, you know, crazy. But, but he said that, 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 that time and space go away under certain conditions. They just go away. Mm -hmm. So it's a good point, which is that time is no longer a purely linear thing like it used to be in the Newtonian universe. So it's like, how do they deal with that? You know, it, it curves in on itself in some weird way uh, under extreme conditions like the Big Bang and black holes. Mm -hmm. So that ain't determined you can't fit determinism into that model and, and in, in in the chapter on science i say that's one of the ways that, that causation breaks down is einstein's you know infinitely dense black hole big bang thing the laws of physics don't work that means there's no time or space or there's no time or space as we know it right yeah so it's a good point it's like i i take what you're saying is hey time is more complicated than this train you know, yeah. and, and the answer is they don't deal with it. Determinists don't deal with this stuff. It's just incredible. Mm -hmm. I wish we had time for the science tests, you know, <laughs> because they've taken, they've done, you know, these science tests. There's a chapter on the book about it and determinists say, oh, that proves that we're determined because there's these neural impulses that go bing before we make decisions. And they have these tests in the laboratory where, you know, you move your finger and they measure this stuff and they go, aha, there's this dingy impulse. And Harris, of course, puts three of them in his book and says, you see, it's indisputable. We're determined by our brains. And when I started reading this stuff, I realized that's not at all what the tests are saying. Absolutely a total distortion of what they're saying. Mm. And I had my five reasons or six reasons why they're just absolute bunk, you know, and it's, and it's scary because he's a neuroscientist and he so distorted the scientific history. I mean, he really misrepresented what these tests mean. Because I went into him going, God, this is, if there's got this impulse and then we do something, that's pretty good evidence we're determined. Fuck, how do we get around yeah. that? And then I read the tests and the test didn't say that. And the authors didn't agree with that. And the percentage correlation was like 60% or 80%. You could do a coin toss and figure out what we're going to do next as well as 60%, you know? He doesn't say, and there's other interpretations and there's measurement problems and all that. He doesn't go into any of this. You know, but he got a big advance for his book. <laughs> um, my last, my last point. It, it's just, just, so if we ever do this again, I would love to, to dissect the science test because it's really a, uh, a real misrepresentation. Mm -hmm. And unless you go look at the actual tests, you're a reader like me, I read Free Will, and you go, oh, fuck, these neural impulses, and then we decide, really, every time? But that is not, that, but, but that's rejected by all kinds of tests and all, I mean, can't go into all the details, but it's a real misrepresentation of the science. Mm. Total misrepresentation. My last, my last point as well, just to, I've, I've really wanted this because you've got such a curious mind, is, do you know very serendipitous moments? So when people say, oh, it happened for a reason, that's a quite a cliche saying. Have, yeah. have, you, have you ever had anything that's happened of a very serendipitous moment where you've thought about somebody that you've not spoken to in years and years and years and years? And yeah. then in that moment of thinking or talking, they've called you out of the blue. Do you have a, a theory, a feeling of what's happening in that moment? Or is it yeah, like purely I do. coincidence? I, yeah, I do. I think, I, I think it goes back to something Daniel says, which is there are such big currents in the universe that we don't understand. 
that connect things that we don't think are connected. Mm. You know, and I, 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 th I don't think we've begun to, you know, we've sort of get the idea that they may exist, but I think they exist. And I think, and, and intuition is partly tapping into that, you know? Um, and I, I, I think that when I think of somebody, there's been, I know they're thinking of me. You know, somebody you think, just think, comes in your I know they're thinking of me. And sometimes, sometimes they're not, you know, because we confuse ourselves. But I think we're tapping into that, that sort of thing, things that connect us that we just have an inkling of and don't understand. I don't think they're serendipitous. You know, I don't think they're happening for no reason. I think they're happening based on currents and energies that we don't understand. You know, mm -hmm. and yeah. by the way, they could be serendipitous, sometimes could be. I mean, I don't think serendipitous things do happen, but I got a feeling it's just my guess or my opinion that we're connected in a lot of ways. And what we think is serendipitous has a much deeper current running there. Mm -hmm. I, like, I like your attitude. Mm -hmm. I like all our attitudes. I think we're on a similar wave. <laughs> and by the way, I also, the, the flip side of that is that I think we're too quick to say, oh, that had this meaning. You know what I mean? Because now we're creating a meaning. Now we're not taking, in a weird way, it's not taking responsibility because it's saying, oh, that happened and therefore it means that, as opposed to that happened and I'm going to take it as meaning that, meaning taking some responsibility for the way we interpret events that are not very explainable. Do you know what I mean? It's like if we give our power to the event, if we go, oh, well, that was a sign that blah, 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 blah. It could have been, but it also could be that you're bringing an interpretation that you hopefully find empowering to you about why it happened. You know, I don't, I think we have to, and we all do this. I mean, we have to, when we take things as a sign, we have to own up that we're taking them as a sign. Does that make sense? Have you ever heard of a book called uh, Transurfing Reality by any chance? No. So you might find it very interesting. So uh, it's by a guy called uh, Vadim Zeland. Uh, it's transcribed. For, it's transcribed from Russian. And essentially, it's a. You, I think you'll find it, it. It's kind of out there, but I think it's on your kind of wavelength. Uh, it's basically five books in one. And basically, one thing he talks about there is basically don't take things like, for example, if you if you see like in this country we've got magpies. I don't know if you have them in in, in America. But essentially, uh, if you see one magpie, it's meant to mean bad luck. If you see two magpies, it's good luck. And basically, what he's sort of saying is like, you're putting that meaning to it. Like, they're just magpies. Mm -hmm. So if you believe it's going to bring you good luck, guess what? Like, you're going to set things in motion for it to bring you bring you good luck. If you mm -hmm. think it means bad luck, guess what? You're going to start to put things in motion. When anything, anything bad happens, you're like, oh, mm -hmm. because I saw those two magpies. Even if it's got nothing to those two magpies, you think that's what it is. So yeah, I don't know if you've read that because it's kind of like similar to what he says. Yeah, it's like, we're, it's like we want to surrender our authority so quickly to the meaning of things. But how about, it sounds like he's saying, well, take, take our responsibility for it. Yep. You yep. know, we have some hand in, inter it really happened, but we have some hand in interpreting it.